Welcome back one and all to Gokaiju, the ultimate anniversary season. In part one, we set the foundation for discussing this show by way of opening ideas, motifs, internal team dynamics, and how all of that function in this particular show. So it's only right that we pick up where we left off and talk about how all of that speaks to this colorful cast of characters. And we might as well do it in order of recruitment because that just sounds like fun. So we'll, of course, start with the captain himself. Captain Marvelous is a man that fully embraces the absurdity of his own name by doing any number of crazy, yet entertaining, things. And while I can't say I was always a fan of it, I did enjoy the way his attitude shifts in some subtle ways as the show progresses. We talked previously about my misgivings a little bit with the Magi Ranger tribute, and how it created an odd dichotomy between what he wants out of Doc versus what Doc actually needs to be. But on some level, the show understands this, and instead of doubling down on that, we eventually are treated to a vastly matured version of both characters, where Doc simply being brave enough, but mostly just resourceful and resilient, ends up winning the day over trying to be a marvelous XP and failing. This is also something that can be readily observed when comparing episode 2 to the final story arc, in where that one kid comes back a bit more capable than before, and Marv treats him a bit more like a human. Not necessarily because he's stronger now, though that helps, but because Marvelous is in a better place now than he was when the season started. And all of this really comes into form by way of his relationship with Bosco, since you can't really talk about one without the other. Bosco himself I'm not sure warrants a great deal of discussion individually. He's what you'd expect out of a backstabbing former crewmate who is enjoying this way too much. But as an idea, he's crucial to not just defining the foundations of Marv Sterner hard to please outlook, but to understanding just how much he doesn't want to be like that, a point that demands a bit of clarity. The reason I think that is because even though Marv is very notably wary of Sentai alum who have already proven a lot, we have every reason to believe that it's kind of a facade. His skills, experience, and desires are genuine, but he's also much quicker to trust his gut feeling when it comes to the recruitment of most of his crew. I mean, he just saw Joe fighting one day, immediately bonded with him, and made him his first mate. This was the first recruitment he made post Bosco Betrayal, and it also feels like the one that contained the least amount of hesitation, and that makes some sense considering how similar they are. But behind his pushy, showy nature is a captain that wants to believe in what he initially sees in people. It may be difficult for him to open up, but once he does, it becomes that much easier to see the real him. And this, in turn, adds credence to the views his crew has regarding his leadership. It's easy to scoff at the idea that Doc and Aim have to vocally defend him, and the others to a lesser extent, in a hilariously high number of instances. But unlike the Zangyak and their leader, they aren't forcing themselves to be obedient for the sake of not rocking the boat. Pun intended, obviously. But rather, they too believe it. Even before they knew about Bosco, they knew Marvelous was someone who valued them all in largely pragmatic ways, yes, but also in emotionally honest ways. And more than anything, he tends to understand what the individuals on his team needs. He knows that Joe and Luca sometimes need their own space to handle things in their own way, and respects that. He knows that Doc needs someone to believe in him more than he believes in himself, and Doc vindicates him for that trust. He is very keenly aware of all the ways that this crew would be much, much lesser without I'm, and is just as aware of how much stronger they are with Guy. All this to say, Captain Marvelous proves to be everything Bosco isn't right until the very end, which is also why Sally ended up being so important. This is a minor detail compared to the big picture of the dynamic between these former pirate teammates, but I really like how they use Sally here right from the first scene she's in. It's there where we actually see her first, initially shrouding Basco before he reveals himself. And over the course of several episodes, it's Sally being used as this almost automatic defense mechanism against many of the attacks Bosco faces, 
This is important because we know Bosco doesn't need to do any of this and proves his individual power on a number of occasions, but it speaks to Bosco's philosophy of utilizing the power of others as shields, whereas the real reason Marv stands in front of his crew is so they don't have to take the bullets that he does, which, incidentally, is literally how he proves himself to Alada in that movie we discussed. Marv doesn't want to get back into the fight for the sake of pride, at least not exclusively. He wants the people he placed his trust in to trust him, and even his biggest dream isn't worth losing that. Which feeds pretty nicely into Joe Gibkin, notable for being the first guy in the crew he trusted in spite of how understandable it would be if he didn't at first. The Gokaijers, generally speaking, are really good at presenting themselves in ways that speak to their histories without needing to fully highlight it. So also, in general, you don't really need more than a couple easy to reference flashbacks and touch points to really get where they're coming from. Joe, I think, presents a small exception to that, only because through him, I think there was a lot more we could have learned about the Zangyak influence beyond what we see and what's most clearly implied. We see a version of Joe already haunted by the loss of his best friend and mentor while already being fully off-board with the methods and motives of his former employers, but he still worked for them, and I personally think seeing that initial decision and how desperate it likely was at a time before Joe became a master swordsman would have added a lot to both sides of the conflict. And it would be yet another neat way to really dig into the roots of Sentai, and even Tokusatsu more broadly, as a response to a war that Japan found themselves on the wrong side of. That said, his past relationship forcing him to open up in ways similar to Marv still works pretty effectively, and it ties pretty neatly into a live man tribute that, by all accounts, would not have existed in the original drafts of this show. Granted, the way a similar plot point plays out in Live Man is very different and in some ways more hopeful, so it's interesting that the advanced science the Zangyak have access to goes beyond what Live Man Joe has ever seen, allowing for no recourse for what was done to Sid. I liked it as a character beat for Joe, who now has to deal with Bizorg in a more permanent manner, even if you maybe saw the smallest of insinuations that a brighter outcome was still on the table. It shows that even when the heroes can't overcome everything through sheer will, they can still resolve themselves to push through it. An obvious fit for the messaging of this season and a pretty clean tie into how the entire story wraps up. That will naturally be a part 3 topic, so put a pin in that for now. Next to be picked up along the way is, of course, Luca Milfi. It bears highlighting, in case my implications weren't already clear, that I think she's pound for pound the best acted performance of the bunch. It's loud, it's proud, it's in your face, and doesn't hold back for anyone. Plus, Mao Ichimichi adds little flares here and there that are not especially easy to catch and aren't always focused on, but adds so much more to the complete article that is Gokai Yellow. A lot of this can be observed by way of her relationship to Aim, but specifically how it's primarily just this natural thing occurring in the background until it needs to hit the foreground in the often cited episode 23. It's in the early stages of that episode where Doc and Guy make sure to mention how doting Luca can be, as a direct contradiction to her usual state of being. But looking back carefully at previous episodes paints a very clear picture. When Aim is injured, Luca shows almost immediate concern, as when I'm overworks herself in the Geki Ranger tribute, and caught up in the backdrop of episode 13, another really good 22 minute spell, is Luca going ballistic over the fact that I'm is out there somewhere apparently kidnapped. All this happens as a very neat way to lead into the idea of I'm being like a second sister to her, and then I'm rightfully challenging the ways Luca can at times express that affection. After all, I didn't spend all this time on self-improvement just to be shielded from everything. And the way the writing just naturally understands how this dynamic would be very beneficial to both, while also somewhat suffocating, and not have those things be mutually exclusive, is genuinely clever and shows a really good understanding of both women here. And also, the episode is just really good, easily among the best this season, surprising absolutely nobody. So while it can be very easy to lump Luca into the rough around the edges trio, as I have done, in truth, she operates more in the middle, 
and similar to Marv, she does need that firm sheet of protective toughness as a survival mechanism, but it doesn't stop her from caring in her own ways, be it the tough love of episode 6 or the comparably lighter touch she developed when handling a different kid in the Christmas episode. And it all feels like it comes from the same place, foundationally, which is deceptively hard to pull off. But Luca accomplishes the impressive feat of being genuinely multifaceted in ways that lends authenticity to her past as well as her present. It's also why, on top of the minor mending of her relationship with I'm needed for I'm sake, I'm glad we also got something not quite as good, but arguably necessary with Doc. He, by contrast, is not doted upon and tends to come off like a burden to Luca more times than not. But, in your typical legally obligated body switch episode, I just really appreciate how it ends, and how Luca in turn appreciates Doc's natural level of caution. He's not just doing his typical skittish thing here, he's far more concerned about how what he does could impact Luca's body, even if Luca doesn't necessarily share the same concerns about Doc's body. And I'd like to think the writers understood this too, and the added bit of perspective Luca gained from the experience ended up facilitating the aforementioned lighter touch she showed during Christmas. Even though you'd probably have a pretty entertaining character if you just reduced her to a physically imposing treasure hoarder who had to cheat, steal, and lord knows what else just to be standing here, her growth takes her into another plane. But it also feeds into my broader ideas about the sheer incalculable value that Doc and I have on this team. We learn so much more about Marv through these two, and likewise, Luca would not have those same layers without I'm and Doc to a lesser degree. Putting the focus now on Doc presents us with a lot of circumstantial production changes to his character. Doc was reportedly supposed to have a much more involved backstory that was changed in the mix with all the other changes that Gokaiger went through. So instead, we get what we got, which was a stab at creating a true-to-form everyman, now featuring a more nebulous backstory that pays lip service to a Zangyak attack without investing as much emotional energy into it. Now, I'm of two minds regarding how that adjustment plays out within Gokaiger's story. On the one hand, I like that they can tell different kinds of stories with distinct vibes and personal angles through Doc, because his baggage is decidedly less heavy. But on the other hand, if they were going to head down that path anyway, I would rather they just cut out any flimsy connections to a Zangyak ravaged planet and simply made him the one guy who didn't have to suffer through any of that, directly or indirectly. After all, he neither has any long-standing vendettas against particular enemies, nor do we have much insight as to what he's lost along the way. Doc is literally the guy that was dragged into this because Marv knew he could fix things that were broken. Otherwise, he'd have simply held on to his past life and hoped that he could just survive whatever the Zongyak were doing to the rest of the universe. Even his nickname, since his real name is Don, was something he didn't choose for himself but got used to over time, to the point where Guy calling him Don felt weird initially. But I lean towards forgiving whatever incongruencies come from the lack of a Luca-level exploration of Doc's past, because I find the character very charming in his uniquely derpy and awkward way, and because a lot of his episodes are compelling. Part of that charm is him thinking about the idea of combat in a very different way. This comes through beautifully in his fight choreo that just bursts at the seams with personality in ways I found especially effective. And we've already mentioned how his ingenuity way back in his first big test scored him and his team their first legendary powers. But I think part two of the O-Ranger tribute, in where he develops the Gokai Galleon Buster, really brings it all together. Not just because the solution was something only Doc could do, but because doing so involved a certain level of trust across the board that we couldn't be immediately certain he'd receive. And it can't be dismissed out of hand that they are knowingly placing themselves at a disadvantage against an enemy they can't crack on the chance that Doc's idea could bear fruit, and it doesn't initially. Dipping back for just a second into how this ended up being translated into Super Mega Force, it's not especially surprising that this became a Noah episode and not a Jake episode, despite Jake transitioning to green that season. But it does make me wonder why they didn't just make Noah green from the jump, since he's far more aligned with Doc's sensibilities. You can even hold on to the simple explanation joke that everybody either loves or really hates. 
I think Jake comes with his own clear-cut host of insecurities, but they come off a touch more subtle than Doc's far more expressive put-upon nature, so I do think that swapping the two in that season would create stronger character continuations from where they were in Megaforce as Go Sager counterparts. I say that genuinely liking episodes like Blue Saber Saga, but even there, I could make the case that Jake's specific sense of fragile pride would have fit very cleanly into a need to prove himself. This sort of ended up happening after Orion showed up anyway, a Guy Doc team up episode that actually was very well adapted, but I trust you see what I'm getting at here. But getting back on topic here, I mentioned it a bit when we talked about Marvelous, but what sells the entire bit of Doc saving the day is Marv's unironic belief that he can. It conveys how far both of them have come on this journey. I mean, hell, just a few episodes before this, Doc finally lays into Marv a little bit about how his usual power collection method tends to be bad, actually, something he'd never do earlier on. But you know what else really sold me on this moment? The fact that after a certain point of bold heroics, Doc straight up stops and says, yeah, that's all I've got. This show is just really funny sometimes, but I think there's more to this as well. If you're going to have one character embrace such a moment while not having it explicitly tied to his history, as with the others, it works as a genuine punchline to have a clear stopping point. That said, this was also as good as Doc could muster. It was enough. Not just because he's doing exactly what he can, as was the point of the episode, but also because that's as much as it makes sense for him to do based on how he's written. Going further risks making his achievements feel embellished for the sake of it, and in my opinion, that would actually cheapen what this episode means. So regardless of what Doc was meant to be prior to the multitude of adjustments Gokaiju went through, I think the person we ended up with was quite good. And before I'm stole the show from me and refused to give it back, he was the reason a lot of the early stuff was engaging. And speaking of I'm De Famille, she is, without question, my favorite Gokaiger character. A character so good at resolving conflict that all she has to do to stop it is want it to be stopped. But even for as mimetic as her role on the team can be viewed as, just like everything else we've discussed so far, there's an honesty to it that the story very much understands. In my review of the Ghost Sager Team Up movie, we briefly touched on the role she plays in a lot of Gokaiju tribute episodes. It's something I find genuinely humorous through much of the show, but I also think this is an important part of what Gokaiju did a lot better, or at least more convincingly, in the middle and later episodes. After a while, this semi-predictable trend just naturally became something that the team was more aware of, to a point where Marv's standard operating procedure as a means of procuring powers was less frequently applied. So instead of being forced into the role of conflict mediator, Aim's role and general outlook naturally became much more of a central guiding principle for everyone. In the early days, Marv would just be yelling at Doc to do this or that crazy thing or pushing him out of the way, while he wears that same Ron Weasley-esque constipated face and tries his little heart out. But then the show nudged itself into the direction of him and I'm being far more right than wrong in their approaches. What we just discussed as it pertains to doing what you can, and that'll be enough, that applies here as well. Granted, that idea is presented as something the show wanted you to believe was a calling card of Amato this whole time, when many plot points would suggest just the opposite, but the sentiment was there at least, and I'm a Wild Force fan, which means by law, I can't bemoan any show for changing its mind on important details mid-story for the facilitation of a better story. And that's pretty important, because I think I would have actively disliked the show if it went in the other direction and demanded that Doc and I'm an eventually guy develop into the type of colder badasses that their crewmates present themselves as being, at least on the surface. And this cleanly transitions into the one time I'm tried to do exactly that. Episode 41 is very, very good. It digs more into Aim's reason for being here as a direct result of the Zangyak monster who didn't just kill her parents, but burned them to the ground. And perhaps an earlier version of this show would have emphasized how vital it should be for her to handle this solo, but the status quo at this point has long since shifted, as we discussed. So instead, it's this really neat episode where the one time Aim thinks she has to do this a certain way, turns out, no she doesn't. 
It was a time where the show could have let her have a Marv moment, but instead, it's a way for the entire team to feel cathartic about a victory for all of them, even if it was especially meaningful to her. Because they know they need her so, so much. And because of the influence she continually has, it further lends itself to stepping away from Resolution's earlier episodes might have almost certainly stepped into. There is a lot of shows that would not recognize this and think her getting the chance to be the showy badass, even if just this once, would be par for the course. There is an argument to be made there, mind you, though not one I would defend because I think that would weaken her character and the show. On top of all of that, there's something else that I'm really captures here. As a former princess that wants to empower what remains of her people through her actions as a pirate, she feels most in line with the hope that Gokaiger embodies as a season that responds to tragedy. And I kind of have to bring it back to the Gosager movie at least one more time here. Because another thing we discussed back then is the Sentai alums doing otherwise normal jobs, but continuing to instill hope in others. And this side plot is something the movie almost verbatim takes from the earlier episode 13, another Junko Kimura writing highlight, in where I'm finds the original lost soul in need of guidance and hope, and does what I'm does best. And sure, Toku is no stranger to the never give up mindset, and a lot of it can come off like hollow platitudes, but the way this story operates, and the way I'm specifically is written for, makes even that idea feel like real, genuine understanding. Especially since she's spent so long in this crew and on this team, so compared to most royalty, especially the royalty on the other side of the conflict, she'd have a lot more insight into the plights of those way less financially well off than she was. What we see of many Gokaiger characters is a response to hardship that doesn't often risk allowing other people in so easily, and I think that's necessary to make full use of Luka and Marv. But I'm strength comes from a considerably different approach. She lets people in, she lets people know how she feels, and she makes it easier for other people to do the same. There's a lot of neat anniversary elements scattered throughout this show. Some I keenly understand, most I have no first-hand insight on. But nothing captures that more than I'm's sense of empathy and natural inclination for unity in the face of struggle. She doesn't just say it, she is it. And in more of a spiritual way than a literal way, she leads the entire team, hell, the entire show, to a place where they eventually catch up to where she always was, barring one run-in with her past. And she is primarily why I was at long last able to finish a show that didn't find a way to grab me the first couple of times I tried it. It's a bit ironic, since I knew well before starting this show that Luca and Marvelous are huge fan favorites. And it's not hard to see why either, I had a lot to say about both, so trust me, I get it. But I am ended up being everything I didn't know I wanted out of Gokaiger. The fact that I ended up mostly liking everyone else too, but especially Doc and Luca, just elevated the season that much further. And last, but, well, for me he kind of is least, Guy Ikari. A bit anticlimactic after waxing poetic about I am for however long, so bear with me. That said, however, Guy is a complicated character for me, even though on the face of it, he's got far less going on than most of his teammates. On the one hand, this is a show that embraces celebrating the legacy of Sentai, albeit somewhat unevenly and originally, it was going to be markedly less even. So I can understand the logic behind creating a Sentai nerd character who is endlessly excited for the task ahead, in large part due to his firm separation from most things traumatic also very unlike his team. I think there's a lot of kids that could and maybe did resonate with that boundless, unapologetic energy. And I can also understand his need to be this loud and this expressive due to his constant moving around when he was young. He never got to experience any real stability, up until now, so it was either give in to that idea and keep people you may never see again at a distance or risk it all by being your pure, unadulterated crackhead self, knowing that you'll annoy a lot, but ingratiate yourself to some. And I can also especially understand the desire the writing has to keep placing him in situations where he could possibly renounce himself in front of the heroes he looks up to, only to learn to tell them that no, 
This is my role now, and I plan on becoming just as great as you were. However, a lot of this is undercut by their need to keep making the same joke over and over again. It's an awkward balancing act that I'm not sure the show ever fully found a way to balance, as it pertains to leveling out his obsession with Sentai with more of a genuine respect, since it's a role he now has to live up to. I'm not even convinced that his more controlled attitude towards meeting Mammoth Ranger counts, because if the city hadn't been leveled minutes before, we would have seen the same guy. Needless to say, I wasn't much of a fan of the fanboy over here, but I found him a lot more endearing as a combination of concepts compared to the equally drugged out Genta. But I came away from the season just wishing that some of the ideas for him would have found a way to stick for more than 5 seconds at a time. And with that, we conclude our part 2 character breakdown. Part 3 will see us to the end of our Gokaiju reviewing journey as we tackle the villains, the closing arc, and my final thoughts on the season as a whole. But until then, thanks for watching.